brothers and sisters, friends and visitors. I wish to greet you all in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. In the precious hours of acknowledging his creation and accepting his redemption as we stand in this bring of eternity, the end time of end time, we need to consider the beginning of our life and our experience in Christ Jesus. There is a history in one of the counties in England. There was a farmer who began to dig a little well that he may have some water. He dug well and he found water. And he discovered the water happened to be a kind of a healing power. It is kind of miraculous touch. And this water was widely spoken by his neighbor. The neighbor decided to draw some water from this farmer. And then he appreciated the healing and the miracle power of this water. It was sweet to taste and it could heal someone who is in need of physical health. And this neighbor told the other neighbor, and this popularity of this water uh, spread around in the neighborhood. <clears throat> and the, soon all the neighbors started drawing water from this place. And it was sweet. And it was wonderful. So the news spread far and wide. And the people started moving into this locality that they can have the benefit of this water. This man was not selling the water. He was uh, freely giving this water. And soon, little shops and little small markets came and started little businesses. And finally, they founded a county, a little bit of organizing a village and became a little bigger town. And the town became so thick, a lot of people around there. Years passed, and the popularity of this village went all around, and the village became a town, became a history. So one journalist and a scholar decided to some research and to put an article. Then he came to this place, he met with the mayor, and he talked to him, mayor, and we know the history of this little town, and how it was found, and is it possible for me to go and see the miraculous fountain, the miraculous well? And the mayor looked at his eye, and very sadly said, look, journalist, scholar, it is true that this, the village was found based on a fountain, and it grew out to be the big business town. But sadly, today, we don't know where the fountain is and where the well is. It became a kind of business establishment. It's a kind of uh, that city that makes money out of everything. It could be the same thing and the fountain of life, which could be life-giving which would be giving a health-giving, miraculous power of water that is Jesus Christ is in many places made a business commodity. People sell relics in the name of Jesus. People sell waters in the name of Jesus. They sell all kind of material making a business commodity. There are popular mega churches make money out of the name Jesus Christ. Now, brethren, we who are gathered here are not just going to look Jesus as someone who could be a business commodity, but is a life-giving power for you and for me. 
And the similar situation, in time of Jesus, Jesus came to a well. And he knew the history of the well. The well was not disappeared due to the business. The well was still there. But here the scenario is the opposite. He founded the well. And he made a conversation with the person who was standing there. You know the story very well. And the conversation ended in, he was asking water, and the conversation ended in such a way that he would give water, whereas he asked for water. And she asked, okay, you say that you can give water, but you have nothing to give. And he tells more powerfully the water that he would give. It is not only quench the thirst, but it also gives a power that he will never thirst again. Such a water, if it is going to be existing here, a lot of bottling companies will be losing their business. Jesus tells here that, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him, shall be in him a well of water springing up into the everlasting life. It is just not only a healing, miraculous water. It is a life-giving power in this water. It is just not a life like the people try to maintain today. It is life eternity, which is the original plan of God, that man was designed to be with God forever, to live with him forever except as he lost that provision as we have studied last night. That provision was to continue that the man has to live with him forever, for which this one thing was needed, that you must drink the water of life. Now in this conversation, Jesus was trying to find out if she understand who Jesus was. She tells in the beginning, in the conversation, Jesus disclosed the life and experience of this woman. He said, you must be prophet. You can tell everything. No, he was much powerful than prophet. He makes prophet. He reveals a secret to the prophet. So he knows everything. He's omniscient. And he can know everything. <clears throat> he knows it all. Then, she tells one thing when Jesus was explaining about the power and the connection. In John chapter 4, verse 25, the woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. You know, the conversation went on to the powerful way of worshiping. Then she tells us, Messiah will come and tell everything. And Jesus tells in verse 26, Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Okay, now she puts everything. He is a life-giving power. He tells the secret of my past. He can tell everything of future. And here is the Messiah. As soon as she heard what she did, she forgot the purpose of her coming there to the world. She threw the pot and pitcher and everything. He ran towards his town. He tells the great message. Verse 29. Let's see what he says here. Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this Christ? And he tells the interpretation. She understood the meaning of Christ, which is Messiah. He, she understood the message, the meaning of Christ, which is Savior. And he brought the entire town to Christ. Now, many people find Jesus in different way. But let's see quickly what Jesus is to you and what Jesus is to me. And what would be Jesus to, to my friend and my family, my entire town? Martha, when he was sitting there, and she has an experience after the resurrection of Lazarus, her brother. 
Matt, John chapter 11, verse 27. She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. Martha recognized that Jesus is Son of God, and the woman at the well recognized that he is a Messiah, he is Christ, he was Savior. And Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Matthew, Gospel, chapter 16, verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter says exactly the same thing. He acknowledged Jesus as Son of God. And Gospel, John chapter verse 1 through 3, John tells that Jesus is Word. And Jesus is a creator. And Jesus is, is a man, is a flesh. He was in flesh and dwelt among us. And this is all the things that the people see that Jesus is a Messiah, Jesus is a Savior, Jesus is a fountain of water, Jesus is Word, and Jesus is creating all things, and the one power which was with all of us. And um, chapter 20, John the Gospel, chapter 20, verse 28. John 20, 28. His experience with Thomas. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, my God. He acknowledged Jesus as God. For each people, Jesus means something. But now let us find out what Jesus tells about him and with us what is our relationship. Jesus says in John the Gospel, Chapter 15, verse 14, he says, You are my friend. What? Jesus tells that you are my friend. And Jesus says, you are my brother. He is not ashamed to call us as his brother. And Jesus being our older brother, the best friend of us, brethren, we have a wonderful opportunity to share our love and our experience, our faith. And he showed his love because a friend gives his life. Indeed, he did. And what we can give in turn, we can give our heart to him, a broken, a contrite heart that we can give it to him. And what else we could do is that if you're a friend, we have to have some connection, something to prove. What we can prove here is that if you're my friend, you have to abide with me and abide in me. And if you're my friend, you have to do whatever I tell you to do. There is something, a reciprocal experience. You are my friend. You should be in me. And then you will have something to reflect. What is the reflection? If you're my friend, you will do what I tell you to do. And you will reflect my character, my image. This is exactly what we see there in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. They find out that the people in the time of Jesus, when they saw the disciples of Jesus, when they found the boldness of disciples, they said they had been with Jesus. What made them to identify that the disciples had been with Jesus? The way they talked, the way they execute everything, the way they carried themselves, everything spoke thousand times of that they had been with Jesus. Even the one who denied Jesus was still reflecting some characteristic that he had been with Jesus. So my brethren, if Jesus calls us friend, then we need to abide in him. And we need to reflect his character. Then we will have wonderful experience. Now let's go back to the experience of that woman who was at the well. When she found the Savior, what did she do? She ran with the good message. She told everyone in the village, her friends, family, neighbors, everyone shared the good news 
a gospel of good tidings. This wonderful message that we have to carry, my brethren, James tells us as another experience, if you are a friend of the world, you are enemy of God. But there is just an opposite. There are certain things that we have to shun. That thing that is from the world, that which would be drawing us and be rooted with the world and its experience down here, I think we have to shun. We have to think everything that is above. And uh, as a Christian, it's not only we take the message and the good message to others. And just like uh, Peter and the, the, the Paul and Silas, what did they do when they were in prison? They were singing. And not only they were singing, they were telling the message of the crucified Savior. And then after the prison was opened, and in Acts chapter 16, what did they do? Went to the home of the, the prison keeper, and the entire family had the wonderful experience of having Jesus in their home. So my brethren, the good thing that we receive, we cannot keep it with us. It belongs to the whole world. Jesus said, go ye into all the world. And it includes my friend, my neighbor, my society, and my brethren. And if we can be a light bearer, Jesus called us to be a witness. Jesus called us to be light bearers. And he calls us also uh, in the, uh, for an important purpose of enlightening the world with his glory. Now, we as his friend who is abiding in him, doing his will, should have a wonderful experience of carrying his love and his message to others. He gave, he manifested his love of Father, gave himself in the cross, and that way he proved that he loves each one of us. Now, as we say that, if we say that we love him, we should also say that if you love me, keep my commandment. Let us follow him in our words, in our action, in our sharing the good message of Christ in our life to others. Christ in you, in the hope of glory. And in the meantime, when the people saw Christ as a savior, Christ as a messiah, Christ as a fountain of water, John also sees that Christ is the lamb which was slain from the foundation of the world. Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Whereas the angels tell that uh, Jesus is the light to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. And he, Jesus, is the light. He is the glory. And his character, his glory should be reflected in our life. And the Father himself says in Matthew chapter 3 verse 17, This is my beloved son in whom I well pleased. And this beloved son of the Father, this friend of us, this wonderful Savior and the Messiah of every one of us, should be a motivating factor in our life. The brethren who spoke and the then they delivered the message before me. They had been telling one thing in common. Our forefathers had been always telling that this would be the last delegation session. They were looking forward to go home between the session. Between the session, the executive, in the, the general conference council have the, the power to do the things on behalf of the people gathered here. But then the brethren always thought that it's not with that council that should execute the business. It should be the power of the Holy Spirit which should prepare them that they will soon go home. They may not see another general conference here on the earth. They will do it there, up there in our home, real home. But as we are on the earth today, there may be something positive, something negative. As per our key text there, we may be having all kinds of difficulties. As Paul was persecuted, prisoned, he was punished, and he even having all kinds of isolation, desolation, everything. Yet one thing was driving him. The driving force was Christ, that he was not um, quenched by all those persecutions, 
problems, penalty, and everything. One thing he said, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because that abolished death and gave eternal life. This gospel, this eternal life should reach everyone. So today, those who teach sometimes, we have to teach the unpopular uh, message. In the unpopular message may not be received wonderfully. It may not be welcomed. Even unwelcomed, unpopular message should be preached. Even though we may face some discouragement, difficulties, problems in our life, in our family, in the church. But prepare to meet all those things for the sake of Lord. He will give us power. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open the door, I will come in and I will sup with you and he with me. Now, oh brethren, invitation of Jesus for you and for me is wide open. It's a time for us to listen to his voice that we will have the wonderful time of having Jesus supping with us. Then we will be ready for the great banquet which will be over there. So now, can we, as we commence the Sabbath, contemplate upon his suffering on the cross? Truly, when he said, a good friend lay his life, which he did. When he called us friend, indeed, he is our friend. And if you can accept him as a friend today, is a popular uh, in the common statement between two friends, a uh, friend request, and accept the friend. And in this time, and Jesus is knocking, and he is expecting you to accept a friend request he throws upon each one of us. Are we willing to accept that? And this today, uh, in the community today, the youth population today is well versed in chatting and communication, electronic communication. Our communication today should be with heaven, with our friend and our Savior, Jesus Christ, where the signal will not fade and we can continue having a wonderful experience. And we, as the people of light, said, you are the light of the world. And the remnant people who are called to bear his light as a light bearer, as an ambassador, we have the message today for our friend. And it's like the friend request. One friend introduces another friend, and we have more friends to come to the foot of the cross. When you come and kneel at the foot of the cross, we have reached the highest position in the world. And that is what we need to. And when you come to the foot of the cross to kneel before him, let's not come alone. Let's bring at least one friend. And then the friend multiply. The one friend became two, and two friends became four. Four became 16. And 16 became 256. It goes on that far. And we don't have to make a big target. As some people, some other churches, they make a, a thousand a day a million harvest, whatever it is. Let us make a target, a friend for Christ. Just one friend. And that one friend reach another one, then we can make a wonderful friend circle together with Christ Jesus. We'll have an excellent experience. My friend, my Savior, will be your friend and your Savior. We will have a greatest experience. My brethren, at this time, and with this thought, in our mind. We need to contemplate on all these sufferings and all the things. And he said, I'm not going to live alone. He said, I'm going to give you power. That power will be excellent power. In the upper room experience they had, when they received what? The Holy Ghost. They were able to go and multiply friends, multiply believers. It was not in ones. It was in thousands. So now, as we stand here, we need to expect the same thing. When Christ went up, 
He sent us the Holy Spirit. Now we need to ascend our prayer that we will receive the power and the power of the Holy Spirit that will empower us that we may be able to have the harvest experience. It's not you and me, it is his power. And in the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we have another wonderful thing there. Neither there is a salvation any, in any other, for there is none other name under the heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Those who are waiting for his coming has a message of going and teaching and bringing the soul for Christ and which will be added, converted into a crown, the, the star for our crown. And then before they were empowered, there is one more thing as a friend of Jesus they did. Acts chapter 1 verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And everyone in upper room, they had one common purpose. That is, they have to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to have the same experience. In order to have that power, they were in one accord. And now we are all having the same purpose. We have the name as an Adventist waiting for the coming of the Lord. And with that hope, those who are waiting for his soon coming and believing in his promise that, behold, I come quickly. And we need to also ask for the blessing on empowering of the Holy Spirit. And Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of the rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the houses where they were sitting. And that should be our experience before we depart from this place. And the camp meeting like this, the conference like this, a holy convocation, a solemn assembly is a place we should pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. My brethren, we cannot leave from here empty-hearted, empty-handed, let us go from here with the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we can be a wonderful witness when you go. We can bring a friend to Jesus that more friends shall be added. And we might be able to finish the task that is before us. The task given to us is taking the wonderful message of salvation to all the world. As the brother was speaking uh, this morning and yesterday, we need to carry the everlasting gospel to all the world, bringing everyone to fear God and everyone to bring him, them to the awareness of the judgment of us that is to come and the soon return of our Savior and Jesus Christ. The, all the happening of the world today tells us that we have no time is left. The countdown begins. The countdown begins for his coming. The countdown begins for all the final events to take place. And there will time come that we may not have the liberty to carry this book. We may not have the opportunity to stand on a pulpit to preach. Time will come that we may not be able to have a worship on the day the Lord has given to us. So in this day, in this time, the given opportunity, we must use, make use that we may bring a friend to Jesus. Jesus for you as a friend. And Jesus is for your friend as a friend. That will be a wonderful experience for us. Let us take home an excellent experience of our Savior. Together we can go, when we go to our home, we can tell the same word of Joshua. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. The time of test is just upon us. And we need to stand. Before we stand the test, we need his power, his spirit. And this should be our prayer. And this should be our thought 
that we could be able to have a greater experience. I just want to read for you one thought from the testimony in conclusion. The experience of Jesus with the woman at the well. The water that Christ referred to was the revelation of his grace in his word. His spirit, his teaching is a satisfying fountain to every soul. In Christ is the fullness of joy forevermore. So when we accept this gift, the fountain of water, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, never crave the words, advantages, and attractions, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of spring up unto everlasting life. Let us accept his grace. Let us accept his teaching. And let us accept his uh, gift that we might be able to have a wonderful experience of quenching our thirst. And one more thought from the testimony. Again, without the cross, man could have no connection with the Father. On it hangs every hope. In view of a Christian, may advance with the steps of conquer. For from its strength, the light of the Savior's love, when the sinner reaches the cross and looks up to it, the one who died to save him, he may rejoice with the fullness of joy, has reached the highest place to which man can attain, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. May God help us. Beholding him, we will be changed. Looking at the cross, we will have the wonderful hope renewed and the promise of eternal life can be a refreshing memory in our life. Let us behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Accept him as a personal savior and take him home as our friend and introduce him to our friend as a friend. With this thought, I invoke you all to ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we may have the greater experience of joy in our life. This is my vision prayer this evening. Amen.